Languages, like all living things, can go extinct. And once they're gone, they take with them not just a form of communication, but a way of thinking. Here at the University of Michigan, on a campus their ancestors once called home, a group of professors is working to restore, preserve, and revitalize the Ojibwe language, a language that was once far more widely spoken in North America than English. Jimmy Rhodes has the story. Hear me. We've seen the stereotypes. We lost them, Kimasabe. Oh. Of course, they're crude caricatures, but these dated portrayals were symptomatic of a mainstream culture that looked to the past to distract it from a disturbing present. For decades, the United States government carried out a systematic plan to disconnect Native peoples from their culture. The Bureau of Indian Affairs was part of the War Department, and the U.S. government had a policy of eradicating language as one way to shift so that these people who were demanding space and land were assimilated and that was the stated goal. There was a boarding school system designed to intentionally eradicate the language. For generations, Native children were stolen from their families and forced to attend the boarding schools. Practicing Native religions or publishing or teaching Native languages was literally a federal offense. That's why a scene like this. Ani Bakanage Jikpane. Ani Bakanage Jikpane is so remarkable. Margaret Newry is the director of Michigan's Comprehensive Studies Program. They estimate 230 languages that are endangered that are indigenous languages to this continent, and most people say there will be about three in 30 years. So I'm sorry, wait, three? Languages left. Left? Yes. Out of 230 yep. that are right now on the brink? Yep. And, and there are some that have already been lost, I would imagine? Or? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's tons. I mean, there's 581 federally recognized nations in the U.S., and all of them at one time were connected to some linguistic tradition that was their own prior to colonization. Margaret's challenge is to reverse that sustained erosion, and she's not alone. Mama. Did you grow up speaking Ojibwe? No, not at all. I mean, that's why Howard and I are a very unique and effective pair in a way that neither of us could have planned, and the university benefits greatly from having both of us here. I would probably be part of that first generation where we didn't grow up speaking it, but we learned it when we were older and then went out and got PhDs. So I don't have his fluency, but if we're together somewhere, there's not a lot we can't engage in terms of dialect, vocabulary, or even just linguistic theory. <laughs> but during his years off the reserve, even a native speaker such as Howard Kimwan almost lost the Ojibwe language. My first language was Ojibwe. I learned it from my parents, my grandparents, and everybody spoke it very well. And at uh, some point in my life, I moved off the reserve and worked in building industry. And uh, they gave me a two-week holiday from my job in Grand Rapids and ended up in the Sioux. They had an immersion camp where people were just talking the language to their students. I was so happy to hear my own language being taught to some other people, which I never thought that was never going to happen in my lifetime. My mom says, you should start teaching the language. So from that point on, I'm still on that two-week holiday. I quit my job, went back to school as a language instructor. There's not enough of us the speakers to go around teach these people how to speak. You know, it's, but that's uh, what you're working on, right? That's what I'm working on here. I hope I get maybe three or four graduates here in about four years that I, I could send away and teach the language out there in, the, in reservations. Elise McGowan and Michelle Sabu are native students at the University of Michigan. I am the first generation of my family not to attend a boarding school. My grandmother was sent to a Jesuit Catholic boarding school and my great-grandmother was as well. And so my great-grandmother was the last one to speak the language and she did not pass it on to anyone. She knew it was not cool to be Indian so they, and plus they were so far and they were separated so there was no chance of learning it. That sounds really kind of painful that not cool to be Indian, not yeah. cool to speak the language. What does that mean for you to, to take that back? My mom, when she was little, she used to get teased like all the time for be, being called like half-bred or whatever. And so to be proud to be native, I think, is really important. And just like I really want to teach that to my sisters and to like other natives too that, you know, we are here and it's cool to be native again. <laughs> yeah. 
The Ojibwe class also attracts non-native students, such as Katherine Hutchinson. I went out to Boston to do an internship in pediatric cardiovascular surgery, which is what I want to do after I go to medical school. And I was out um, at Children's Hospital in Boston, and I heard a family. They were trying to find a translator, and people in the hospital had no idea what they were speaking. And well, I walked up to them, and I'm like, well, they're speaking Ojibwe. Not that that's going to help you, because you probably don't have a translator on staff for that. But that's what really made me think, OK, I really want to learn that language, because there's a need for it. The commitment to an Ojibwe revival spills off campus and into the surrounding community. Meg hosts a drum circle that includes students and Native community members, such as Linda Purchase and Marsha Traxler. What's most meaningful is that the tradition is alive, and the people who are following the tradition are coming together to support each other. I'm not fluent with the language, but I can sing, and I can share through my singing. And outside class, Howard and Ojibwe lecturer Alphonse Pitawanaquat continue to slip in language lessons while handing down the traditional culture. Now, do the students in the program, do they get exposed to these traditions? Oh, yes. The information was passed on before is through storytelling. And even when I was growing up, this was going on. Margaret and Howard even reach out to the community in the best way possible, with food. <laughs> Ari Weinzweig and Alexander Young host an annual Native food event at Zingerman's Roadhouse. This is our third annual uh, Native American Foodways Dinner, and this is great food and it's great culture and it's a huge part of the, the history of the country that people really don't know about, and so it's very exciting for us to be able to present it. Is it a good way to introduce people to a culture is through the food? I think it is, yeah. Certainly if you can find something that you enjoy and, and it may be new to you, that's a great way to appreciate a culture and start to learn about it. But a true revival isn't just about traditions from the past. It's about carrying Ojibwe into the future. We can get people engaged and move things forward. I mean, there's nothing more fun than going to, say, our Facebook site, and you just post one little word or phrase, and all of a sudden you've got three elders saying eight different ways they might use that. You know, I'd do these four. I'd do it a different way. And so the ability for someone to pick up and start running is a lot greater than, say, 20 years ago, when somebody might have thought, I need to learn this language. It might have been just them and a book. With Ojibwe online, in the community, and in the classroom, the language isn't just going to survive, it's ready to thrive. What happened before is too hard, too complicated, but this is a living language. I am not ready to put it on a shelf, you know.